Hello, this is episode 23 of Tour Talk, and this week we're crossing the streams and welcoming Ethan and Clint from the Metal Up Your podcast, which is a brilliant show devoted to all things Metallica. The guys are ideal guests for us here on Tour Talk because as well as hosting their own podcast, they're also songwriters, touring slash session musicians working out of Nashville, and Ethan has also worked on the crew side of the industry, guitar teching for Kings of Leon, before actually going on to be part of their live band. They're about to hit the road for the first time together, so we delve into their thoughts on how that's going to work out, their approach to working as session musicians in Nashville, and their thoughts on cover versions specifically of Metallica songs. We also talk about how the guys met, the origins of their podcast, and how they've reached the heights they're at now after four years of discussing Metallica. New episodes of Tour Talk go live every Monday, so please subscribe, comment, and like if you enjoy what you hear, and help us spread the word by continuing to share this with anyone you think will enjoy. This is Tour Talk. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us, guys. It's awesome to have you here. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. This is our first little crossover podcast collaboration type thing. I don't know if you've done something similar before, but this is new for us. We have done this before, and it's it's fun. It's I feel like um, I feel like we're all part of the, like an intramural volleyball team. I've talked about this before, a la Top Gun, and uh, we're playing volleyball <laughs> in the sand and maybe slapping each other's heinies when someone makes a good play. Uh, Shirtless. Podcasting feels kind of like the Wild West, so it's fun to team up with people, especially people who are doing like-minded stuff. Oh, yeah. Should have brought the short shorts. Didn't get the memo. I wear them all the time. I'm, wearing <laughs> I'm not right wearing now. any shorts. I thought that I, I, I thought I could have sworn I read that in the email. <laughs> oh, yeah. Damn. Hey, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, part of the cool thing about all of this is that there's always like a degree of separation, and somebody always knows somebody, or there's always a link between people, especially within this industry. Just seems to be how it works. I mean, do you want to kick off by like how you guys know each other, Nate? Ethan and I met into the summer of 2000 and. 12? 11. Ten, it's 10 years ago. Like 11. This 2011. Summer. On the Vans Warp Tour. What a shocker. Yeah. We've already hit Warp Tour. Yeah, we, we spent a lot, <laughs> of, uh, a lot of days in a hot-ass parking lot uh, drinking beer and making fun of all the bands with makeup on because it had to have been a nightmare to put that on every day. On, in oh, the I didn't know the, the Cure was on Warp Tour. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. Oh they, yeah, they, they were on the side stage. <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, uh, it's it, I look back on it with often like very happy memories, but I know in the moment I was I was very unhappy, very displeased. What van, what bands were you guys playing with on Warp Tour? Reliant K for me. Okay. And I was in my a, a band called Lion Eyes. Um, and the funny thing is we were all we were on the what they call like the amphitheater stage. So it's kind of like the second main stage. Um, and it's a A B situation. So a band's set up. Comp- it's a dual stage. So a band is set up on the left, while the other band's playing. And then the second that band's done, the next band starts. Um, and I just remember being the only band, basically, on the entire <laughs> on the entire stage that would have less than ten people, maybe five, six, seven people. Ten people would be. A stretch. Those kids didn't get it, man. They didn't get the, the glory of lion eyes. But like a sea, like like Moses parting the sea, right? I mean, it, as if someone drew an invisible line, there would be uh, five thousand people waiting to watch the other band <laughs> to the right and have zero interest in what we were doing on stage. I've, so it I've, was it was a long hot summer. I've definitely been there. I've definitely played those shows. So they were stood in front of a stage watching nothing. Instead of literally just turning their attention yeah. and, and watching you guys, I mean, you, Correct. you would see, you would see, like if, like there was, there was times where like Reliant K and Lion Eyes were like right before or after each other. So if we were playing and Lion Eyes was next, like we'd have a big, a bigger crowd than, than while they were while they were setting up or whatever. And, Correct. And if if that was the, the order, we would always all the time. If there were bands we loved and got to know, we're like, hey, everyone, go watch this band because they kick ass. And then if it was the other way around. <clears throat> You know, we would always, you know, be setting up, and I would always notice all the kids would be like looking over to you guys, like may not been in front of the stage, but it's just it's a weird tour, man. But th- I that- love that Ethan somehow found a way to say two nice things about himself. Number one, <laughs> more kids are there to see him, and then also the worst one, actually, Ethan, that you just did is number two, how cool you guys were for telling people to go see the band that no one was seeing. I mean, you somehow wedged that in there. 
to be fair, he he was one of five people that I enjoyed meeting that summer, and um, the actual the only the true cool redeeming part of the whole thing, I because Ethan it always influences me to be more positive, which is a very 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 tough. That's very that's, that's a, a that's a feat. So so I will say this: there were more people watching us from the side and backstage. More we we had m- much more bands and uh crew people watching us than ever than ever were in front of us and i mean sometimes we look back and there'd be dozens and dozens of people watching the set who were on the tour so that was always really cool but that's the, that's the last nice thing i'll say for a half hour <laughs> well sometimes on a festival you almost want that more you know if if you want the the your peers to know that your that your shit's good there's like a power in that too i i remember doing festivals like that playing an earlier slot and then like for some reason, towards the end of the set, a bunch of people are coming, and it's like, oh, they must have like heard that we were here. It's like, oh no, Jack's mannequin's playing right after us. That's yeah. <laughs> ironic. That's why I think Jack's mannequin was now. on the same tour. <laughs> yeah, literally, <laughs> amazing. Did you guys hit it off straight away? Was there a? I think like, so. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a thing that kind of happens on Warp Tour. I've done it twice, and it's almost like. If you're whoever your bus drivers are friends with, as far as other bus drivers are concerned, they always park near each other, and they and sometimes they kind of have to because you know those bands are playing the same stage, and so yep. everyone on the same stage, for the most part, you start to get to know each other, and by the first few days, you realize who's going to be a good hang and down to earth, and who's not. You know, it's usually often, in my in my opinion, <clears throat> the younger bands that are out there like in their early twenties, like really trying to prove themselves and be cool or something, and it's like it comes off so poorly i think for people that have maybe been touring longer so i know with us and reliant k at the time i mean we, we you know they they've been a band before i was in the band i've been touring at that point for over you know t- 10 or 11 years and and you know you just connect with people and and, and like-minded people and 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 that honestly becomes the, the way to get through a tour like that because it's eight weeks straight of all outdoor venues thunderstorms coming through 110 degrees in new mexico whatever so that that really is what helps keep your sanity is, is becoming friends with people like Nate and, and bands like the Agrolites and the Street Dogs and all this stuff. So um, it, it became a really great community. And I'm just the kind of person that, you know, I'll, I'll walk into a crowd and talk to anybody. And so I, I, I did my best to stay in touch with all these people after the tour ended. There is a bit of a lesson in that in terms of staying in touch with people because these things come around so often that you will eventually end up bumping into these people. And it, it's always good to kind of have those relationships like the build throughout. Agreed. So... Am I right in thinking that you guys are going on tour together for the first time? S- yeah, so mm-hmm. I don't know if Nate knows this yet. I was actually waiting to tell him. Do you know this news, Nate? I know nothing. Well, so so the person that Clint got a gig with maybe two months ago, I guess, other guitar player, wasn't happening, brings me in, and that gig is someone you have co-written songs with named Morgan Wade. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Killer. So, yeah, I, w- I was crazy. Gonna, uh, I was gonna like send you a photo, like cause my first show with Clint and Morgan and the band is on Sunday, and I was holy gonna shit just randomly send you a photo to really confuse you, dude. It worked out. That's <laughs> awesome that you that you wanted to do to do that. This is like a gender reveal. It is, yeah. <laughs> did I wait? Did I so surprised if I fucked it. So wait. So who, I'm confused. You also play with every, You play with Morgan too? Yes. Oh. Yeah, so Clint basically, you know, like like a lot of us do that are, you know, either session musicians, touring musicians that aren't really in a band, Clint sent out, you know, uh, uh, just some feelers to some friends that are either touring people or, you know, whatever, and got a call back about playing with Morgan, and then he went and did some rehearsals, got the gig, and played has played some shows so far, and then, like the kind gentleman that he is, he... Uh, <laughs> You know, saw an opening and 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 brought me in, and so uh, yeah, I I again, my first show is a Sunday, no rehearsal. I've just gone over songs with Clint and rehearsed them here at home. Crazy, yeah, man, amazing. And this is the first time Clint, Clint and I have been on the road together. Like we've always toured separately, and, and Clint's been in the country world a lot, and I have not. So we've always, you know, been on other sides of the world when we're both touring, and so th- it'll be really really cool and unique for us to be on the road together. Clint, did you do the shows in in Florida at the Key, at the Key West Fest? No, I came in uh, right actually right after that. Okay, cool, awesome. It's a pretty big show as well, isn't it, for your first one to do together? Y- yeah, Willie Nelson. What's the show? Opening for <laughs> Willie Nelson. Oh, holy shit! Yeah. That's I like crazy. That Ethan, That's wow. amazing. Congrats, dude. I like that Ethan just said yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, it, it is. is. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a big deal. I was leaving it open for someone else to, you know, just <laughs> interject or something. That's really cool. That's I'm glad it's all working out. She's a, an immense, uh, an immense singer and a great songwriter. And yeah, that's the, I'm glad she's got great musicians behind her too. That's it's gonna be fun. A big step. So, do you think that like the dynamic you've got with being friends and doing the podcast is gonna survive being on tour together? No, that's a good question. No, not at all. <laughs> we should we should do a follow up in uh, right after the fall because we're gonna we're about to get in a sprinter for about six weeks together, which we've oh, never wow. done. Yeah, and, and it's been a really long time since I've toured that way since before my kid was born. My kid's about to turn seven, so I actually have a lot of my own just personal anxiety going into it. Uh, and Morgan's never the artist we play for; she's never done anything like that before at all. So there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of like, I mean, those can be some really fun tours if the team is good, and mm-hmm. and that's yep. what a lot of the last month or two, and that's what part of bringing Ethan in was about was getting the team tight and right for <clears throat> what's going to be pretty, gr- I mean, pretty grueling for me. Mm-hmm. I'm not 22 anymore, you know, so <laughs> um, that's going to be hard, I think, but super fun. Absolutely. So what, what bits of it do you think are going to be hard? I mean, obviously you've done all this before. You've survived mm-hmm. it. Plus, obviously you've been on warp Tour and survived that. Where's that anxiety come from? Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know how Ethan feels about it, but for me, it's being away from my family. I mean, the last five years I've toured with a, um kind of a national country artist and it was pretty comfortable and it mm-hmm. was basically weekend warrior touring is very fam the country music industry in nashville is very family oriented and it was basically we bus out thursday night we're home on sunday and so lovely we were we were paid well and you know we had guitar techs and we never dealt with any of our gear it was it was really comfortable mm-hmm. and we weren't getting rich but i mean we were making a good living and it was really comfy and uh this is definitely we're in a van uh we're loading into clubs we're responsible for all our own gear we're away mm-hmm. for a long t- i mean i haven't i haven't been gone for more than 10 days uh in seven years wow so this is going to be i mean it's almost the entire month of october and almost the entire month of november so wow who, who, who um, are you guys allowed to say who you're who you're yeah. on tour with yeah we're opening for lucero another work Amazing. tour Oh, yeah. I'll see you guys tonight i'll be at the nine thirty club show yeah if awesome. i'm oh, yeah. in town yeah if i'm here oh i'll be there do you live in dc yeah. Do, oh, you do? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm well, in D.C. I, uh, when I saw the itinerary, that was another thing that actually helped my anxiety is when I saw the itinerary. I mean, I haven't played some of these rooms since I was playing in rock bands, which were some of my happiest touring days. And so seeing the 930 Club or Webster Hall or correct. All, the, all the cool mm-hmm. correct, the, or the, I said correct, all the cool <laughs> clubs that we're about to play that I, you know, I've been playing a lot of country stuff, so, you know the mosquito festival and the fucking <laughs> you know a lot of festivals a lot of saloon type places so mm-hmm. a lot of places where line dancing occurs so this is uh <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about being back in rock clubs which is kind of where i was born you know so and to do it to do it with ethan is is i'm super stoked i think that's going to be really helpful because you know i know him really well we're both you know i'll, I'll call us seasoned ethan mm-hmm. oh, yeah. not older cats but we're seasoned mm-hmm. We know how to do it, and we know how to go around the merry-go-round and be a little healthier than I was in my 20s. And our drummer, too, his name's Parker Gens. He's great. He's also been around. He was with Wheeler, Wheeler Walker Jr. forever. We know how to do it and how to be healthy. And so I think that's one of the things that's helping me not have a panic attack about it. Is I, I, I've got a bunch of guys around me that are also committed to doing great work and being healthy while we do it, which really wasn't the case 10 years ago for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and in my situation coming in, I'm a bit of the opposite of Clint, where, you know, I'm used to being gone for at least six to eight weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. I've only done one of the weekend warrior type tours in my entire touring career, and I've been touring since I was 19. And so, the only really big difference for me is, you know, talking about the comfort level of touring. You know, whether it was Reliant K or, or when I was, you know, working or playing with Kings of Leon, it's like it was very comfortable. Buses, you know, in hotel room, that whole whole deal catering all that stuff um but there's part of me that always misses those days of of just getting in the van and hacking it out you know and 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 from time to time i've done it there's another band that i only play live with and they only do maybe one or two shows a year called the leaves of memory it's a couple of the dudes from super drag and you know there was a time where we went down you know a couple years ago and played south by southwest you know from nashville to there is like you know 13 14 hour drive and there was like nine of us 10 of us in a 15 passenger van and there was something about it where I was just sitting back going, like, this is awesome. Like, uh, you know, this is how I started my touring career, like traveling across country in a van with a bunch of stinky people and getting, you know, got in van wrecks, 
you know, bought fireworks and shot them out at the other band on the highway, which is really safe. Uh, but, you know, I'm looking forward Jesus to it. Jesus you know? Christ. I know, we were idiots. I've never heard anyone, I've never heard of that before. Dude, when you grow up in Southern California where fireworks are just illegal everywhere, the second you see a fireworks stand, your mind is blown and you just go spend whatever little money you have when you're 19, 20 years old on fireworks because it's we never got to do that. Unbelievable. Really. That's yeah. cool. So I'm looking, so the second, we see a, the second we see a fireworks stand on tour, Ethan's going to get fired, I think. <laughs> yeah. li- li- I will literally get fired. He was great until we passed a fucking fireworks stand going towards Bristol. And, and <laughs> Was there something wrong <laughs> with, the, with how he played? No, no, he played great. He, everyone no, he clicked played great. He just started, sh- he started shooting Roman candles at, at police officers. It's really sad. Every other part of the gig he was really great at. It's just the fireworks thing. He went insane because he's from <laughs> California. Hey, so Clint, so why, why go from the comfortable thing to getting back in the van and, and doing it how you did it 10 years ago? Where's the, where's the driver for that? Uh, well, part of it was 18 months of no work, yep. and, uh, which was really scary, and hard on my family. Um, but also a good time. I mean, I, I haven't spent that much time with them that intimately ever, really. And uh, I, was, I taught my daughter first grade at home, which was a oh, wild man. experience. And, uh, you know, just like, like most people, you guys included, it was a tough year for industry people. So part of it was when it came across, it was like, oh, well, I need to do any, I need to go work. <laughs> but part of it too was um, a good friend of mine, Sather Vaden, produced her stuff. And him and I have really similar sensibilities. We've been friends for a long time. And he was trying to put this band together for her. And uh, I think he was having a hard time finding the right thing because of, there's so many interesting things about what's happening with her. She's kind of a green artist, but mm-hmm. she's got a lot going on. She put out a great record. There's a lot of buzz. She's going on this club tour. She may not be doing support touring much longer. So all these dynamics are are in place. So when he brought it to me, it was like, hey, you're not going to get paid what you're used to getting paid. You might be getting in a van, et cetera. But the music's great, and I think it has somewhere to go. And so I, I hadn't heard a record yet. I, I knew that it was people who I respect said it was good. So I knew it was probably good. And I knew Salar, if Salar was involved, and he was excited as he was about it and is about it, that it would be good. But I took it immediately because <laughs> I, I needed to have something to do. Uh, but then as I dug into it, I was like, holy shit, this is really good. And then when I met yep. Morgan, we became friends really quick. And now we've been playing shows. I, like, I really like her. I really respect her and where she's She's a very authentic person. And I think that's actually why so many people are resonating with her album and resonate so deeply when they see her. She's a very, she's a killer, you know? Yeah. She's a fucking killer, uh, plain and simple. And... Uh, so as all of those things came into place, it was like, oh my God, this is really cool. I felt really grateful and lucky, even though it's not something I'm used to. I, I felt connected to it. And I'm glad to be at it, it with her on this level. Mm-hmm. And so as, uh, as we're putting the band together and there were some loose parts of the band that weren't working and uh, it came up for Ethan to be a part of it. And it's just like, you know, he, I don't know how, how much you want to say about this, Ethan, but Ethan had a pretty good paying crew job with Kings of Leon. Yeah. That he that he basically walked away from to do this, and yeah. I think it's oh. because, I think actually part of us being on the ride for so long is like, I mean, I never got rich doing any of the, the better paying gigs I did. I really, it's not like I, I couldn't turn down like Dwight Yoakam money or something. So, and I don't think Ethan and I care as much about that part. I think we were just so excited to be a part of something that we were passionate about. I hadn't yeah. really felt that way in a long time personally. Yeah. And yeah. Ethan, I'm sure that you didn't, you weren't super passionate about setting up someone else's gear. So it's, I think for you and I both, it was like the record's good, the crew seems good now, and she seems like she's about to pop off. So let's get in there and make it great. Yeah, it's definitely a, a really cool situation to get, you know, maybe not the full on ground level, you know, but to get in this early with an artist that I, we both feel have so much potential. And like Clint said, she's a killer. Like I, I haven't even met her yet. I'll meet her at the airport on Sunday, but That's so you know, cool. like <laughs> I, you know, I, I got into a record, you know, when I saw Sadler first posting about it coming out and I was like, man, this is really good, you know? Um, but yeah, just, just like Clint, you know, it's, it's something, it's, it's the type of record I believe in, you know, and, and even just seeing, you know, things she posts or what Clint and, you know, and Parker have told me about her. It's like, man, I haven't even met her yet, and I already really, you know, I'm pulling for her to, to really be mm-hmm. something awesome and special. And I think she already is, and I think, you know, we can only go up from here. And so it's a very exciting time to get in with an artist like this. Which songs did you write with her, Nate? Uh, I've written some stuff with her. It's not on the record, her record. Okay. We've done some cool. writing outside of that. Okay, um, cool. 
I'll leave it up to her to to share to share it with you. you sure. I, th- I think Ethan might have heard one of the one of the tracks, but yeah, it's really cool. good. I, I don't think it, I think it the is. one yeah. that you wrote, the one that you sent me, I think um, to add some, I think lap steel to uh, at home, I think was for you that you co-wrote with her, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great. That's a great tune. Cool. I'll play, I'll yeah, play it for I'd, Clint. Yeah, that's and we will awesome. play it on the podcast now. <laughs> Drop it in here now, fellas. De- definitely don't do that. <laughs> JK. I don't Just want to hear from the... a universal music group lawyer. <laughs> yeah, totally. Just while we're on that putting a band together thing, I think especially for listeners, like because both of you guys are based in Nashville, working as session musicians as well as doing your own thing as well. Is that like a boys club? Is it like it's about who you know and it's about getting a phone call from a friend or do you keep putting yourself out there and like trying to facilitate opportunities for yourself or how does it work Uh, it can i I don't know about a boys club i mean i know it's there's definitely more dudes in it than women but i i do know some females that are part of it it's it is clicky yes um it is it is like really contingent on a network but you know i told ethan this we were actually laughing about it with moke the other night where when i brought him in like i didn't bring him into the morgan thing because i'm a great guy I'm not mm-hmm. the kind of, I'm not as great as Ethan saying, go listen to a lion eyes on the, <laughs> you know, uh, I brought Ethan in because selfishly I thought he'd kick ass and, and I need the band to kick ass. That's good for me. You know, mm-hmm. um, he was, the thing I always tell people about Nashville is there's so much of it that's out of your control, like luck and timing and stuff. But when the door does open somehow, you have to walk through it. Like you have to have the, you have to be able to go through it and deliver. And what I told Ethan when he got the gig, I said, you know, congrats, dude, you got the gig. And I told him, I said, all you have to do is be great. Yeah. I was like, just be great. <laughs> Don't let me down, dude. Like, show up and be as good as I told them you would be. And I know he will, you know, but it wasn't like, hey, I just want all my friends around me. It's like, my friends are actually really talented. And that's what, that's the merit that they got the gig yeah. on. But obviously, I knew him. Obviously, I got the Morgan thing because I know Sadler. And, it is very much like that. And, and the way you get to know people is by just, I guess, I mean, I do, all I did was just go out and meet people. If I saw a band I liked at the basement, I went and said hello to them. Mm-hmm. If I, I remember one of my first weeks in town, I met Tim Marks, who's a session bass player in town. He does a lot of Taylor Swift shit. And I met him at a bar and I literally asked him to coffee and asked, and when we got to coffee, I literally asked him really simple questions like, how do you do this? What do you do about health insurance? Um, so having people like that around was really helpful, but you have also have to be able to generate some of that yourself. I think a lot of really talented people can be in an industry town and they're just waiting for someone to knock on the door. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. like, dude, there's so many talented people here that are hungrier than that. And sometimes you know? that door will knock, you know, un- unexpectedly, you know. Um, but yeah, like Clint said, I mean, it's it's really just about knowing people and and even if, you know, you know a million people in this town. I mean, sometimes, you know, and you're working your ass off to try to get a gig, get session work, whatever. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. You know, there's mm-hmm. thousands of, I'm sure, you know, talented guitar players and bass players and drummers and whatever in this town that have been busting their ass playing, you know, maybe crappy gigs at local places for five people. And maybe we'll never get any kind of phone call, you know. Or I do, like, you know, for instance, I do a lot of session work at the Smokestack, Paul Moke Studio, and as this Clint. And, you know... I've just known Paul for like over 10 years and we've worked on, you know, records together, you know, the f- projects I was already involved in and he just continually brings me in and it's, you know, and like, just like, and just like Clint, you know, it's not because we're just buddies. I mean, there's a part of that, but you know, if there's just trust yeah. involved too, Paul trust knows that I'm going to, then I'm going to come in and nail these bass tracks or these guitar tracks or drum tracks or whatever. And, and, and like Clint bring me in with the Morgan thing, he trusts me and he's played with me before and knows my abilities and, and knows my personality and how I interact with other people. So it's like, okay, he'll be a great fit for this, a good puzzle piece, you know? And that's almost more important, you know? Like, yep. anyone can... Pl- Morgan's songs, as you probably know, Nate, are, are, you know, wonderfully simple to play. They're like Tom Petty songs. And uh, so finding someone that can play a guitar like that, no problemo. Finding someone that can get in a sprinter that I don't want to kill <laughs> in, the, in week two, you know? Like, or someone that's not going to be an alcoholic or you know like get into fights or get a nazi tattoo uh those are important to me those kinds of things you know is that something that's happened i've definitely been on tour i've definitely (laughs) been on tour with some racist people for sure yep yeah absolutely i've been in the country world for a while and you know it's i mean 
you will encounter that there for sure. Yeah. Hey, Ethan, it was really here. To, it was really interesting to hear that you're moving from a crew job to go back into the world of like playing live music. Because I don't know whether you know, but I used to work for Anthrax. Um, I used to tour manage Eagle Eye Cherry, and as part of this whole pandemic thing, like I spoke to Nate quite a lot, and I was like. I will do some of that stuff because I do enjoy tour managing and all the rest of it, but I need to play and it doesn't really matter at what level or how many people are there, but I just need to play guitar to people again. Like, was it a similar thing for you or? It's, it's never left me. I mean, <clears throat> I only got into teching work out of necessity, out of needing to pay the bills, you know, um, back in 2013 when I left, ended up leaving Reliant K in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, cool. Like I'm, I'm good for a few months financially. I'll go find some else to play for like no problem. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a problem. It was not as easy as expected, you know, and that was kind of the first year I got into trying to play for other people and stuff like that. Before that, I'd always been in established bands like Nate was in Lion Eyes, you know, um, and so it was a tough transition to go all of a sudden be the guy tuning the guitar to hand to the guy that yep. nor is doing what I normally love to do. It, it, it's it's definitely an ego check for sure. You got to, you know, <clears throat> you got to bury that, you know, and. Mm -hmm. And try to deal with it because it is it, for someone like me who is an artist, a writer, a performer, whatever. You know, it it it, it sucked. I mean, it was tough to sit there and watch someone else do what I had been doing since 1998. And um, and and since 2013, I've gone back and forth. You know, it's like I, I did the Kings Leon thing, and then at one point, their auxiliary guy who I was teching for, who was who was an old friend of mine, he was going to leave that position, and he recommended me, so I got it. And all of a sudden, it was like, great, I'm back. Like. That wasn't too bad. It was like a year and a half, and I'm back playing. This is awesome. And then due to some other unfortunate circumstances, I got replaced. And again, I'm, now I'm in a rock and a hard place again where I'm like, well, shit. Nazi tattoo, by the way. It was a Nazi tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, yeah, a lot of those. Full circle um, with that story. That's cool. <laughs> but yeah, and then, you know, again, out of necessity, it, it's like I had to go back into teching again. And I've done that numerous times. And then I got on a tour with a band called Need to Breathe as an auxiliary player. And then back to teching again for Brandy Carla. It's mm -hmm. just, you know... When you're, at least for me, you know, I did it out of necessity and I kept moving forward because I knew that I wasn't done playing. You know, there's a lot of musicians that will go tech and then they're maybe more excited about that bigger paycheck. Because in general, in this in this industry, a lot of techs get paid way more than the musicians, especially if well, you're and really it's more tech. And it's more consistent, you know. Yes. My friends yeah. that have gone gone into the crew world there's a bass player I'm thinking of right now. I don't know if you guys have ever know him, Jeff Irwin. And uh, he's just easily one of the best bass players I've ever worked with. And he's got a big family. He had three kids. And when he, he did one summer where he started doing Lady A teching, and it's like, dude, he's like, he'd never had insurance for his family. He'd mm -hmm. never had that level of consistency with a paycheck. So for him, it was like, well, I tried, you know, I tried to do it, but he never really looked back. And yeah. uh, I get it. It's, it's weird. It sucks. It, it you know what uh, it does do for you though if you're in a position like mine where you have done that tech work and that crew work for X amount of years. When you do get a gig like this Morgan gig that is you know already even though I haven't played a show it's already exciting. Uh, it makes it that much more special you know because it's like I just put in all that work doing this. I was about to literally I mean the Kings Leon camp are prepping right now for this whole album cycle and I was about to start that with them. And then this came in and it was like, it made it feel even better, you know, um, to, to get something like that. And I just, I know, you know, in my heart that I'm, this is what I'm born to do. You know, I, I've been, you know, my dad taught me when I was 11 years old and I've just learned multiple instruments over the years. I've always been obsessed with music and collecting music and gear. And it's just like, it's just, it's in my blood. And so when those gigs do come along after you've switched, after you've, you know, come, done, done a teching gig, it's like all of a sudden... I don't know. It just it, it you 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 try not to take it for granted because you know I could easily be right now just changing strings on someone's guitar and I'd rather be changing my own strings and then jumping on stage and playing you know next to one of my best friends Clint you know. Well, part of the Morgan Way gig I forgot to tell you is that you're also my guitar tech. So, <laughs> son of a. Bitch. I hope that's cool. <laughs> Jk. Um, just so people are clear, I mean, obviously, like if they've got an album cycle coming up, that's literally two or three years worth of work potentially that you're put into one side to kind of take on this moment so it's quite a big decision i don't know whether people really understand that like when a band's got an album coming around like the a lot of that is planned oh yeah 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 that's right and it depends too on you know the size of the band too i mean um like a band like kings leon for instance when an album cycle starts it's like you know 
because of the pandemic, obviously things were different with, with uh, what is normally just called, you know, promo touring, where you're mm-hmm. normally flying to New York doing Fallon and doing, you know, Kimmel in L.A. and all that stuff. Uh, normally you're doing literally a, a tour of just doing promo stuff, maybe some radio shows, things like that in different countries. Um, but, yeah, I mean, sometimes album cycles can last, you know, three or four years, depending on how well that record's doing. So, that's really, I'm, I don't think I've ever spoke to anyone who's done the whole kind of Fallon and Kimmel side of things, like probably from a tech point. Do you enjoy any of that? Yeah, I, I, I I've only actually played a late night show one time. I, when I was in Reliant K, we, we did Leno when he was still doing the, doing the Tonight Show, I think in 2009 yeah. maybe. But um, I've, I've been to, I mean, you can almost name all of them, and I've been there as a tech, you know, uh, with Kings Leon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, Kimmel and Ellen and Fallon, Letterman, Jules Holland, you know, Graham Norton, all those things, you know, and they're really long days, mm-hmm. I'll tell you that. But the first time you get to them, like Saturday Night Live, I've done twice with Kings, and it was it was such a cool thing to see all the behind-the-scenes stuff. Now, a lot of it can get really boring, like the second or third time you return to these shows. You're yeah. like, you know the drill. But... But it's cool to see, you know, like like Jules Holland is special, for instance, because it's all music based, and there's like four or five artists in a, in a big room, in the round, you know. And I remember sitting there as a tech, just like standing next to the dude in, in Kings that I'm teching for. And then I'm I'm looking over here, and there's Sting with Josh Freeze on drums, and then over here, literally across from me, is Lord when she, her first single was blowing up, and then that band um, from the UK, um, Royal Blood, when they were getting starting to get pretty popular. And then it was Kanye West who pretty much held up the entire show, of course. But um, <laughs> but it was just a cool experience to sit around and be like, I can't believe I'm just watching this right now. Like, I'm watching Sting get interviewed, and he just played a police song like, 10 feet away. It was, it's, it's very surreal. One of my favorite tour stories I've ever heard from you, Ethan, is when you, I guess you had hung out with Josh Freese before, who's my favorite, like, working drummer is Josh Freese. And you were trying to tell him, I may be getting the story wrong, but you were trying to say, hey, I've met you before. It was like several years ago, but I don't know if you remember. And Josh Freese goes, I think I do remember. Did we talk about drums? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like that, he was like, I'm not kidding, but did we talk about drums? <laughs> it's like, because you were a drummer. He's yeah. A dr- you know, it's I just couldn't such a tell if he was like kidding, if that's like his go to. Oh, did we talk about drums? Because I'm sure that's what everyone wants to talk to him about. But then, yeah, I'd met him a few years prior, uh, and he, he filled in on a Paramore tour when, when they were in between drummers, and I, yeah. I stopped by the rehearsal in Nashville just to say, hey, and we literally sat around his drum kit talking about drums. <laughs> Did we talk about drums? He was cool. <laughs> um, just like to wrap this whole thing up, like part of what's cool of this for me is that when we interview people that I haven't met before, like I get to go through your Instagram, and I look through all your videos and stuff, it's like, both of you guys are like are great players, but like really different was that part of bringing ethan on as well that like you will actually complement each other in 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 a band scenario that you do something different um yeah i think so i mean the way the way it works with the hired gun sitch is you know i mean a lot of our individual personalities aren't really supposed to come through that much we have a record we have like source material um i think it was mainly that i knew he could hand his side of it so basically i became a proxy for sadler who played all the guitars on the album and so when it when I was helping put the band together with Sadler, which is part of how Ethan came in, it was basically a complete overhaul of what they were already doing live. So it was like meeting out, you know, me and Ethan had like a really detailed rehearsal together where I basically split all the record up into two parts. And I said, here's what you're doing, dude. And it was more that I just knew whatever it was, he could do it. Like one of the things that Nashville just, for better or worse, grinds you into is a very utilitarian kind of player. It, it, your personality can come through later, but usually you get mm-hmm. gigs and you keep gigs because you're just consistently honoring the source material. You may find you may work for an artist that's like, "Hey, learn the record," but then I don't really like the the tone. You know, I played for a country artist who a lot of his big records were in the early aughts, and the band leader at the time was like, "Hey, dude, some of that shit's kind of dated, and part of why you're here is to like make it cooler." You know, so so there's some of that. But with Morgan's record, her record's already super cool. Yep. So it's really more about I know that even can do all that I, I don't have to work the honestly the guy that was there before I just I, I wasn't sure he could do that he, he actually honestly dude he had a little bit too much of his own thing okay where he would kind of ignore the source material for his own sensibilities which I honestly found kind of annoying because um, that's not really what we were hired to do right yeah. I needed Ethan and, and dude even from that's what I, I also knew Ethan would bring a lot of passion to it because like even before we got together he was like hey for this song I'm gonna use a jazz master and for this song, I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm over here going, 
awesome, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, I don't even want to. Wanna, easy, I, I, yeah. I, and it's like, uh, there was a sense of me that was like, hey, you don't even need to tell me. You don't need to tell me what you're going to do because I know you're going to just do the right thing. And uh, that's what I'm more used to. I just knew that he would fit so well with that. I wouldn't have to be like, hey, man, turn a fucking delay pedal. Like, <laughs> what's going on? Our drummer asked me to go tweak the other guy's amp, to which I was like, dude, I'm not doing that. That's ridiculous. Wow. We, we need a guy that we don't need to do that to. But you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. I don't need to worry about what the fucking knobs are like on Ethan's amp. Right. I'm just trying to figure out how to fly with 10 guitars on Sunday. It's going to be tough. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> I got, a, ten, I got, I got a, ten, a 10 guitar gig bag. I'm going to try to carry on. <laughs> You're like, you got the, the, the uh, Rick Nielsen gig yeah, bag. Yeah, the Rick Just Nielsen gig Just get one gig guitar bag. with 10 necks on it, and you'll be fine. Perfect. What? It's flat attendant? It's one guitar. <laughs> Nay, anything you want to ask the guys? Yeah, I want to know more about the podcast, how you guys started. I don't care about the other. I'm very bored now. I just want to talk about <laughs> the podcast. How did you guys get into um, deciding what you were going to do like the Metallica thing or, or how, like how long have you guys been doing it? How did, how did, how did you figure out that you both loved Metallica so much that you wanted to have a podcast about I mean, it? The we, night we, we met. Fir- yeah. We first met, I was playing a gig in town with a guy named Matthew Mayfield, an artist and Paul Moak, who's a, our mutual friend produces Matthew's records. So Paul came to the gig and brought Ethan and I guess you'd already known Matthew. So, but they were like, you guys have to be friends. And the first thing they said when we sat across from each other, having a beer was, all right, Metallic, both of you talk Metallica, go. Like, they just knew that we were both, we were both their friend who loves Metallica. Yeah. So that's how we met. And, you know, it was all the fun conversations you have with Metallica nerds. Like, where do you stand on Cliff Burton? Where do you stand on Load and Reload? <laughs> you like St. Anger? Like, there's all these, like, anchor points where you can figure out who someone is, you know, based on the answers to very few Metallica questions. Yeah. We did all that. We became buddies. And then he, Ethan had the idea to do the podcast. If I recall correctly, Ethan, I did not want to do it at first because I'd never done a podcast. You and were it nervous, like yeah. a lot of It sounded like a lot of work. And it and, is. Uh, <laughs> and Jesus Christ, it is, as you guys know. Um, well, they have Ethan Rob the, to do everything. But Ethan had the idea. I know. By the way, give us Rob's info. <laughs> we, we need to get in touch yeah, with Rob. You guys don't have a Nate to deal with, though. Like you need When you've got a Nate, you need a Rob. I'm the Nate. I can tell you that. I'm the Nate. I don't know. Um, it's, it's pretty pretty quiet. Pretty easy to edit around. Well, that's Today. true. Maybe I'm not quite like that. I'm just but yeah, listening. But yeah, I I, I had I had done uh, another podcast, which is a very part time one, just more of just kind of a passion thing here and there, because this podcast is the priority. And uh, and I, I remember thinking at a certain point in uh, 2016, late 2016, I was like, man, it'd be really cool to do a podcast about a band. And so I started doing research, like, what would I want to do? The Clash came up at first, that's my other favorite band, the Metallica, of course. And so I started researching those two bands and podcasts, and there wasn't a podcast that really existed uh, for Metallica that I could find. We, we ended up later f- finding one podcast that existed. Um, Shout out so, to Metallic, Metallic Chat. Metallic Chat, they're called. And so I just, I was like, I don't want to do this by myself, because this is a lot of info to go through. You know, at the time, it's like they're 35 years into their career, and they're still going. So yeah, I just I thought, man, Clint would be a great co-host for this, and he was kind of ner- I think nervous about it and stuff. And I was like, look, I've already done podcast podcasting stuff. I got it covered. Just come to my house. I know I know how to you know get hosting, get it posted everywhere. We we, we can do this. And so we we decided to you know come up with a name. We had a couple name ideas, um, and then we just started. We planned on doing. We launched with three episodes, um, an intro episode which came out before we officially launched. It's like an introduction to the two of us and our Metallica stories. And then we launched with three episodes on January 1st, 2017. And by the end of the month, we had like, I don't know, 15, 1600 listens or downloads. And we were like blown away by that, you know, and now it's a lot more. But for us to do this in, in a matter of four weeks, getting that many people to listen to us was pretty mind blowing. We're like, I think we have something here, you know. Another podcast started popping up about Metallica. Now I think, I literally, I think there's like eight Metallica podcasts out there. Yeah, we kind of came, we got in at a good time because they boys had just put out an album three months before that was really good, we think. Yeah. And so then they went on a three year kind of insane sold out arena stadium tour all through. They went to, they did the US and Europe twice each, both with arenas, then with stadiums. So there was just a lot of, conversation to be had you know about this cool band 
And yeah, we're we're coming up on five years. Yeah. Oh wow. And, That's amazing. And so it's been. I I didn't think it would last this long. Same. Um, it, it it makes me tired to even think about it. But what happened, I think, that was so cool is that it just became. It became. It's always been about Metallica. And even when we were doing crazy touring, we never missed a week. We were super consistent, which I think was really important. Oh yeah. Ethan would be yeah. on tour in Europe with Kings. I would be in Canada with the guy I was with, and we would still find a way to make sure that every Monday something happened. And uh, it's really just become really more about the community of, of people. And then when we go on tour, we get to, you know, we've had beers with our listeners all across the world. Ethan's hung oh, out with people cool. in the UK. Oh yeah. Um, we surpassed a million downloads, I think before our third year was done. And so it's pretty crazy. we obviously have, have this thing that I think is really cool. I always say that Ethan's kind of the, the jelly and I'm the, I'm the salty peanut butter. <laughs> You're the, crun yeah, the, the crunchy peanut butter. I'm a little grumpy and Ethan's like eternally positive. I'm like smooth Jif. <laughs> which really works for us. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's really more about uh, like when we go to shows and meet a bunch of fans, it's almost like, and we throw a, a big party once a year when there's not a global pandemic killing the planet. But uh People flying from all over the country to come to these parties, and it's become almost as much about that as about Metallica, which is really good because I don't know how much longer I can talk about how much I like Creeping Death. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, I like Creeping Death. It's a good song. You know, there's like only so much I can say about it. Yeah. So we need we need some new material from the boys soon, and they're starting to play shows again. That kind of I mean, I know a lot of people who do band podcasts. They just completely quit during the pandemic because it's hard to generate content about something when nothing's going on. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of um, I was just talking about this with my sister last night because she's not really into podcasting and stuff like that. But um, it, it's very much like starting a band. I mean, the, I think the only difference is we're not touring the podcast. You know, it's you know we're creating. We're about to. But you're about to. I was going to ask. Like, how's that's that true. Look? We will be touring. Yeah, the <laughs> two of us together. We'll be doing a lot of hotel room episodes, which is great because normally it's in different countries, but. It, but it's really like start, it's like starting a band. It's like all of a sudden you get listeners, you get fans, you get people that you know. We, we threw one of our parties that so perfectly happened to fall the night before Metallica played in Nashville. So we had this bar in East Nashville where I live, just packed out till like two in the morning. And at one point we went back to we set up a merch booth like bands do, where I was selling my records. We had podcast merch, and we just went back there just to hang with people and sell stuff. And before we knew it, we had a line across the bar of people that just wanted to meet us and take photos with us. So I was like, this is and like we being sold out in of, <laughs> And we sold out of all of our merch. It was yeah. so fun. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds it's, way better than being in a band. I mean, it's like being in a band without going on tour. <laughs> it, it really <laughs> is. Like, and you're, if anything, you're creating more content than you would as a band. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's every week. So it's a trip. You know, we've got a Discord server where it's like our message board where people chat all the time and we interject. It's crazy. It's, it's amazing. I think, the, I think what's happening is... Uh, people are attracted to that kind of music because I think in general they connect with it because they are maybe lonely or outcast. There's something about the power of hard music that speaks to a certain kind of person, myself included when I was a kid. And so I think what that's turned into as adults is, uh, and then also it's not super cool to like Metallica. They're not as cool as Billie Eilish, for example. So I think all of us at a, of a certain age that really loved them in the late eighties and, and throughout the nineties, there's no one. There's not really that many people to talk to with about it. I sure as hell can't talk to my my wife about it or any of the dudes in in the country band I was in about it. So that sense of community is really, I don't know. It's more than us just talking about the Black Album. I, and I don't think we were prepared for that until it really started to unfold that way. Yeah, for sure. It was interesting to hear you talking about new material because I know that you just started like discussing the the Blacklist because they brought out the yeah. this cover version of the Black Album. Except it's more than just a cover version album because there's endless versions of the same song, right? 53. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Which is it's a pretty, pretty ambitious. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it's all the songs, but it's multiple artists covering sometimes the same song 10 times. So, but all what, very different. So what was interesting for me with that one, like you guys have discovered new bands through that record, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's a, there's an artist from Newcastle in England where I'm from called Sam Fender who covered one of the tracks on that album. Oh shit. What, what was it? Mm. Creeping Death. No. Unforgiving. You know it's not on that album. <laughs> Some kind of monster. Um, Sad but true. He did, did the like the live piano version of Sad but true. I don't know whether you guys have heard oh, it. Oh no. He's not yet. he's blowing up over here. I know it's an artist that Nate's really into. Um, and it's such a different take on on that song that it's it's really cool to hear. 
yeah. someone do that with a Metallica track. It is fun to hear these two. Um, Clint and I aren't necessarily huge fans of like verbatim covers. Yeah. Um, I think it's if it's a verbatim cover, it, tempo wise, key and all that stuff and layout. If it's a, if it's like a cross genre thing, maybe it could be cool. But I love that all the ones they've released so far. I think there's been five or six or so that have been released. That all of them is that artist's own take on it. They're they're reimagining mm-hmm. of that song, and, and and we and we've done that with with Metallica covers on our podcast. We release these EPs to our patrons called Cover Our World Blackened, and we do our own take. And oftentimes they're pretty mellow and and kind of you know ambient maybe, and maybe some country influence. And so it's 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 fun to hear all these ones that they're releasing for the the Blacklist thing. Yeah, I mean that Biffy Claro cover of Holier Than Thou, which Ethan told me I guess is a big band in the UK. Yep. I wasn't familiar with them. Yeah, that might huge. be the, my favorite Metallica cover I've ever heard. You know, that definitely got me interested in them. And Metallica is just so smart about it because, yeah, all these bands are going to take their little slice of the Black Album and they're going to take it all to their fan bases. And it's for chair. They, they just have so many like the optics of it. Are, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, not to sound cynical, but the optics of it are just really good. <laughs> they just really a did a huge good job. promo tool. Yeah, it, exactly. It, and it's yeah, already totally. one of the biggest selling albums of all time. It's just almost. <laughs> It's almost cruel what they're doing, you know? They're like, <laughs> they're just rubbing it in everyone's faces. But the opportunity to get turned on is cool, especially at my age, dude. I, like, I, I have the music I love, and yeah. I don't ha- have enough time as it is to listen to the shit that I love. So for something to come find me that way is still pretty exciting for me because like, I'm too tired and lazy to go find it all, <laughs> you know? I really am. It sucks. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that about doing like verbatim covers and stuff because I think one of the little quotes from that episode was like, I've heard Dream Theater cover Master Puppets and it's just the same thing but with shittier singing and that yeah. really, really yeah. resonated with me. Yeah, totally, dude. That, you know, sorry, Dream Theater doesn't have a great singer. There's a reason that they're <laughs> it, where they are. You know, they're, they're a killer t- technical, progressive, hard rock band, but no one wants to hear them singing Master of Puppets. Yeah, I, I think don't. I think I think no. one of the only somewhat more recent like verbatim covers that I actually really enjoyed was Hailstorm on one of their cover EPs doing Yeah, they did Ride the Lightning, yeah. Yeah, and and it, of course when you have, you know, but you got Lizzie Hale singing. She exactly. If Lizzie's yeah. singing that, she's a killer singer. I mean, and they did it verbatim. I mean, Joe nailed Kirk's solo. It was, you know, it was great. Um those are I think to me some of the exceptions of doing a verbatim cover like um but I mean if, you know, if we do another one of our cover EPs, I'm not going to do, you know, holier than thou exactly like metallica did like i don't have any interest in doing that i want to do some i know but here's creative. the but here's the difference though the, there's the difference between you hear it once which hailstorms ride the lightning you heard it once and we were like that's really cool i have never listened to it again nor do i want to really but it was like oh you're like oh that's cool that biffy claro song i was like i'm putting this on a playlist immediately because i want to hear it again you know what i mean like oh, I, yeah. I was riding with these two younger country girls recently and, uh, you know, Ryan Adams is a douchebag and whatever is going other than him personally, but they had never heard of him. And we were talking about someone was talking about Wonderwall, the song Wonderwall. And I was like, man, have you guys heard the Ryan Adams cover of Wonderwall? And they were like, who's Ryan Adams? And I was like, OK. And so I just played like the first verse and chorus of Wonderwall. And it just basically stilled the entire room. Yeah. The whole room was like it was just undeniably powerful. It's almost ar- it's almost arguably better than the original. Yes, it, you Which could I, make an argument that that if you just heard that one first, that that would be the song. That would be the song. Right. I hundred percent agree, and I think even Noel Gallagher said something similar to that. And he wrote the goddamn song. Yeah. That's what you should aim for. I feel like now it's hard to hit that mark. That's kind of an insane mark, but that's that's what I'm looking for if someone's going to cover a song. Sure. Yeah, sure. And, and there are a lot of examples, you know, throughout music history of of bands that have taken a song and made it their own. One of, one of the examples that I always cite the most is The Clash Do and I Fought the Law. You know, it's like, I didn't even know that was a cover. And I don't even think I knew that until years and years later of becoming a Clash fan. Then I realized, oh, it was a cover from the 50s, you know? So yeah. Yeah, for a band to achieve that is really cool, to, to, to make it their own and make it stand the test of time and, and make it something that will even help people discover the artists that they're covering. Metallica did that for us. I didn't know who the Misfits were when I was in junior high until Garage Days came out, you know? So... It's that's this the amazing power of music and mm-hmm. a good cover and a good song. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Ryan Adams because he covered "Wasted Years" by Iron Maiden as well, and it's mm-hmm. literally one of the best covers I've heard. Full mm-hmm. stop. Like he's got that bit down anyway. Well, you haven't heard yeah. Clint's cover yet. I did a cover oh. of it also that's pretty similar to Ryan's. Clint's is awesome. Yeah, I will check it out. So, have you actually had to think about taking the podcast on the road and like bringing shit with you and how you're actually going to do it? 
Uh, we're, yeah, we yeah. shot yeah. stuff in advance. So we're used to it because because we since we, we uh, when we toured separately a couple of years ago, we would both take little remote recording rigs, which is real simple. It's just a, like a laptop, an interface, and a mic, and yeah. maybe a desktop stand or something. And I was usually writing on the road and uh, and doing sessions on the road. So I even had a little road case that had like an Apollo in it, an SM7. You know, we we have little remote rigs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, most of my last probably two or three releases I've written in hotel rooms. So I'm always, I'm always demoing on the road, just at least rough ideas, some program drums, some program bass, and then I'll record, you know, I'll bring like my old school pod with me and record guitars and stuff <laughs> like that. The little awesome. kidney bean one? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. sitting right here next wow. to me. I, it's still the the very first one from like 90. Still holding eight. it down for the Line 6 pod. It, it, I, I've just got it dialed, man. It really sounds good. <laughs> no, the, dude, that kind of shit's really come around and is actually pretty cool now. Like it's acceptable yeah. now. You know, I, I had one, but I made it sound terrible. So it just sat in a corner forever because I couldn't get a sound out of it. But I, I think that's I, more to do with me than the pod. I had I th- that too, dude. I had a Line Six Spider that had the amp. It had like all the. It had all the. You <laughs> the know, you insane, even uh, had the. It had the tone yeah. of the guy from uh, the band Live, Chad Gracie. It even had a Chad Gracie setting for fucking lightning crashes. <laughs> and I found a way to wow. make that thing sound like shit. I'm a huge Live fan, so that was perfect for me. That's crazy. I just can't believe that that. That guy had a sound on a... I mean, that's really the predecessor to, like... That's, like, the first version of what now is, like, Axe Effects or or, or Fractals that people yeah. use. Like, that's totally acceptable for people to use on, on tours. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Line 6. Line 6 was, like, the first company to really, like, make amp modeling sound good. And actually, yeah. Fractal is what Metallica uses. Metallica's been using Fractals for, like, the last 10 years. So crazy! It's pretty wild. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. Live I've done. A, I, I I did a tour supporting a band that was one hundred percent, um, Fractal and uh, Kemper, Kempers and the whole nine. And it's not for me. Me neither, dude. I will always <laughs> yeah. have an amp on stage, no matter what. It's it's brutal. Yep. In fact, it's so bizarre. You ha- and and for the audience, you have to be in a very specific part of the crowd to get the full effect that's coming through the PA because if you're in the first five rows of people standing there and you you can't hear what the band's doing on stage because yeah. you can't it's just you just hear symbols you Such just a hear quiet Shh. stage yeah wow dude it's fucking hey, really Nate, do you want crazy. to explain exactly what it is to people who might not know who are listening I really don't know how to explain <laughs> it it's a <laughs> digital it's digital amp modeling mm-hmm. so the line essentially goes into an in-ear unit or a floor monitor and then to the PA, right? You guys probably know yeah, better than I do. It, yeah, essentially, it's the AM modeling is, is uh, impulse responses or you're taking a digital audio Tone image print. in a way. Um, so you're, you're modeling amps. Like you're, you're literally taking a digital image of like a Fender, a 59 basement and then like a Marshall cab with, you know, Celestians in it or whatever speakers. And it, it basically duplicates that. And it's all digital, and you can run those campers and stuff through a cabinet if you miss that air movement from speakers on stage. Yeah. Like I know uh, Jack from Bayside, who Nate knows, um, they switched over to campers, and he was sure. and Jack's like a tone nerd, and and bil- he's building his own amps and pedals now, and he was very reluctant, but he was like, dude, as long as I ran that thing through a cabinet, it didn't sound any different to me. He's like, but I'll never do it just direct. I have to have some yeah. speaker on stage. I think that's the kicker to it, isn't it? run it through a cab so at least there's some volume and some air movement on yeah. stage. Yeah. I, I think it's also just like a, a, a spiritual thing too. I mean, I, I, I mean, I can be, I, I guess you can call me the traditional or screaming at the clouds, but I'm always, dude, amps aren't, I'm always going to have a fucking amp on stage. It's not like yeah. amps are refrigerators. Yep. It's easy to put an amp on stage. Yeah. Totally. We, in the country band that I was in, we had an artist that was a little finicky about that. So we had to put our amps kind of like under the decks and stuff, but we always mm-hmm. had amps out there. Um, I guess if you're a, a bass player with a, a, an 810 SVT, then yes, you have a, you're pulling a refrigerator on stage. Yeah. And you should. You get paid the same to play one note at a time. So yes, pull, <laughs> pull the refrigerator, earn your fucking paycheck. Yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna, I work for a band where one guitar player used two roaring EVHs through like, four cabs and then I had wow. the other guitar player used a Kemper through a, the single 4x12 and the difference was like night and day like you can't oh you could compa- tell you know yeah 
yeah, yeah. you could definitely tell. So I would, yeah. I'm of the same thing that I would always try and use an amp on stage. I think the difference yeah. is that you can't fly an amp. You can fly a USB stick and plug it into another Kempa, no problem. Well, and that's what some of my friends who do it have said. They're like, when we go tour in Europe, we don't have to worry about power. We don't have to worry about frying our amps. We don't have to worry about, uh, you know, renting, going to Matt Snowballs, you know, in every city. <laughs> Snowballs we're in. always comes up. That's funny. Well, it's so weird, dude. The time I toured over there, I had to, I had to rent an amp. I rented a deluxe reverb. And there were the, we used a tour manager based there. He's like, we'll just go to Matt Snowballs and get it. I'm like, what the fuck is Matt? Who's Matt Snowball? <laughs> and he's like, well, that's like the SIR over here. I'm like, wow, what a name. I've never even heard of that. And I've, we, I've, I've driven a Matt Snowball Sprinter. <laughs> really? More, more than sprinters? once, yeah. They you drove it? Too? Yeah. Was it automatic or? Yeah. Yeah, it must have been. Was yeah. that the car you were sleeping in when you were stuck over there when the pandemic No, started? that was a Bumblebee camper. <laughs> that was a Bumblebee camper out of Manchester. That's very different. They only have Bumblebee campers. You got stuck in the UK during the pandemic? Yeah, right at the right at the front uh right at the front of it. My my first solo like acoustic tour started on March uh 9th. Wow. Or 5th, March 5th. Yeah, my last normal day was March 12th, so I think by the 15th it was like yeah. really happening. I got home on the 21st or 20th ish. Yeah, I caught I caught the last literally the last yep. flight out of the UK. Damn. Back to the US that was allowed to land. What was your experience like with the UK crowds in terms of My experience with them, I was touring with an artist named Mindy Smith. Is, she's like a folk artist and sure. uh it was a kind of small trio, me on electric, a kind of percussion type thing, and Mindy. And then we had a tour manager and her manager. And my, I, it was, I'd never been over there. And uh, the crowds are just so grateful. Like, yes, they were really polite and grateful. We had to be like, hey, it's okay for you guys to like hoot and hop. Like, you guys can kind of, we're like, do you guys like, the, you know, it was like weird <laughs> that she, the, she was playing like little clubs, like 100 to 300 people. And she hadn't been there in a while, so the turnout was pretty good. But we were like, is everyone having a good time? Like, we couldn't tell, you know? And it's just that they were just really grateful and polite. It was like playing for Japanese crowds or something. Oh, that's like, I was, I was going to bring up Japan. That's I, I, I don't, Nate, did Lionel ever play Japan? Yeah. It's a trip, man. You, you're playing your songs, they're going crazy. And then you, and then in between songs, it's just like, whoosh, silence. Like, they want to <laughs> hear everything you have to say. Yeah, I thought we played some shows. And I'll say this the same for the UK. Like I think that's very indicative of what I've learned over the last few years of the UK folk scene. Is that it is very polite and mellow mm -hmm. and like cool, right. but like the UK rock scene, I would say hands down, it UK, Germany, and Greece. There's no better rock crowd. I mean, right. they they fucking go nuts. Where it's like in the US, it's like they can go nuts, and I've seen it. It's just not every show is consistently bananas. And then you, you, the UK rock, rock and roll crowd is just like, they're fucking ready. I think <laughs> that's ready. why they're yeah. ready. I think that's why so many rock bands break there first. Like US yeah. rock bands will go be, they'll be bigger in the UK before that it really happens here, which I find mm -hmm. fascinating. That yeah. was the story of Kings. It was, yeah. Kings and Leon would go would be playing like five thousand seat venues in the UK, and they would come back here and play Exit In, and it'd be like half full. Well, and yeah. REM, REM, and Tom Petty, they had that that joke about when they went over to the UK for the first time, and they were like rock stars, and then they came back to the states where they were still like little pockets blowing up. And Ron Blair would wake up when they were pulling into like Des Moines. He was like, "Are we famous in Des Moines yet?" <laughs> and they're like, "No, we're not famous in Des Moines yet." You know, definitely not. I mean, that that happened. I mean, ACDC in the early in their career moved moved to England. You know. Um, the Stray Cats hit in the UK before the US. So many Hendrix times. too. So the the and and I think Dario could expound upon this if he wants to. But this is my perspective on it, and this is what I mean. Lion Eyes was for sure bigger in the UK by a, a long shot than we ever were in the states, and it is. First off, America is so big. There's so much to do at any given time, and there's so many different places to go. Uh, the UK being much smaller, and culturally speaking, uh, uh, America is a is a sports obsessed country like none other. There's no other place in the world where not only are people obsessed with sports, but there's football, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, tennis. You, you, you name it. 
and they're they're and, and our our culturally our bars are so these sporting events have social setups in bars and i feel like when you go to the uk there is obviously you know there's football uh and there's rugby and a little bit of other things but it's not so sport centric it's that it's that arts and music are part of the culture like just the rest of the world basically operates like this like if you go play shows in greece there's like 30 bars in athens bars that hold 100 people and there's no tvs wow they're just blaring rock music and they're open all night and all they play is hard rock and in the uk it's the same thing you have like rock and roll bars and Mm -hmm. and so when i think when you look at a like especially in a city like manchester which is a a music city and dario lived there for a long time you you have like a a hundred cap venue and then you have a 250 cap venue and then you have a four and five hundred cap venue and then you have an 800 cap venue and then you have a 2000 cap venue and there's like a place for everyone to grow and there's like a real cultivation of like small bands and then bigger bands in the states it's very it's we treat music very casually here they've been doing summer festivals in europe for fucking 50 years we're just catching on to the rock and roll you know 30,000 person summer yeah. festival here. i've talked so about this a, on the podcast that you know because i've done a lot of european and uk festivals while working for kings of leon and they're just they're just different over there i think the u.s like you said is, is starting to catch up and and there's great festivals here, of course, you know, Bonnaroo and Coachella, Lollapalooza, whatever. But over there, it's like, I mean, I remember getting to festivals I've never heard of in my life in a country I've never been to in like Luxembourg or something. And there's like 50,000 people going crazy at 2 p.m. for like the second band on the main stage. I'm like, this doesn't happen in the U.S. Like half the crowds aren't even there yet in the U.S., you know. Maybe it's a sense, too, of the import of it. Like, you know, like we, you know, it was invented in America. And I mean, maybe because of that, we take it for granted. I mean, that's what the Beatles were always talking about. They were like, they were jamming to Chuck Berry and Carl Perkins and Buddy Holly and, you know, country music and rock, early rock and roll. And it almost over there felt like they just had a sense of how special it was. I don't know, Dario, maybe the one British guy <laughs> could weigh in on this. What do you think? I think it's a, it's a grass is always greener thing because, I mean, like, I look at Nashville, I've been in Nashville and there's like, 50 bars on one street where there's like the best bands I've ever fucking heard just ripping on a Tuesday night like and there's people in those bars where like being in a rock band in Manchester in like 2008, 2009 I couldn't get 15 people to a fucking rock bar to come and see maybe because the band was terrible who knows but <laughs> um, but you were playing your own songs then too yeah, though maybe you weren't those, playing those, Wilson Prison Blues those, those yeah. bands in Nashville are playing cover songs yeah no I get it but you wouldn't yeah. It used to be like that in the UK where there was like a whole pub scene for cover bands and young bands to come through and and learn their trade. But that kind of died out with the last... When I got to Manchester, all of that was dying out and people were like going to bars in town and like listening to fucking terrible music. And like that's what the scene was and that's what all the kids were into. Um, But it is weird here that if you look at... a a major festival like Download, which is the big rock festival in the UK, that the majority of the bands on that bill are American. Like, yeah. it's really hard, especially on the main stage. Like, like Blackstone Cherry are huge over here, but they play to like a few hundred people like back in the States. Like, I think it's something about it being something different or exotic, like not from being around here. So like, it's, I assume that's what well, it is about British bands the, going over to the States. That The grass is greener thing makes total sense to me because my little Birmingham, Alabama idea of it, all I think about is, the, first of all, the Beatles, which I think is the greatest band of all time, the Stones, and I, even like, ra- I'm like, dude, Radiohead's there. Like, yeah. the Who are there, the Smiths. <laughs> All my favorite bands, I feel like I could name a list right now, and I'm like, all of that happened over there. So I have a very romantic thing about over there, too. Yeah, for and, sure. You know, it's just where you're from. We invented it, and I think they perfected it. Is exactly. really what, what happened. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, the Beatles would come back and play Motown songs, Motown deep cuts, and everyone would be like, what's that? And they're like, that's from here, <laughs> dummies. We thought you guys loved that shit. That's going, you know? on, in, that's going on in Memphis, Tennessee, or whatever, you know, and... Yeah, yeah or, or they knew Detroit. about Gary, Indiana. You know, they knew more about Gary, Indiana than people here did. Yeah. But it's like almost every American musician I, I talk to feels that way about British bands. Right. 
but like British bands don't seem to break so much over in the States. Like there's not n- a lot of when they break, they break big, but yeah. they're not there all, all the time. Like if you look it's at it's just the, hard. It's expensive to tour. And yeah. I think it's hard to to have the infrastructure. To, I mean, even mid-level bands, it's just you can tour pretty efficiently here and hit so like I think that's what uh, Nate was saying earlier. There's just so many markets like with Morgan, yeah. we're going to do six weeks and we're basically going to hit every major market in the States in one, you know, in two months. Wow. And for a UK band to come over and do that, it's just for a UK band to all the money even to get here with their gear, with the infrastructure, and then travel and pay for gas and food to play clubs. I guess it's just hard to do. Yeah. No, definitely. I'm glad I'm not on that side of it. I, I'm glad I'm, I'm not privy to that. <laughs> My mom was asking me the other day, she was like, how do people book tours? Like, how does that work? And I don't really know, you know, I don't, I've never really done that, but I, I kind of pieced together from my experience. And I was like, well, you know, you have these promoters and they work with these certain clubs and they're, tr- you know, they, they bid for these gigs and then they have relationships with venues. And as I started to think about how insane it must be to book live music, I was like, I'm out. I tapped out. I was like, I, I actually don't know how they do it. I don't know yeah, how they a, do it and make it work. It's a fucking nightmare. It's a fucking nightmare. Especially now when yeah, you don't sure. know, like trying to go from country to country in Europe and trying to book like a European tour, but you don't know whether you're going to have to quarantine in one country for seven days right. when you get there. or like right. It's a total. To kind of wrap this though, was, have you guys done any shows since the the whole thing broke out? Is this Morgan Wade tour going to be your first bunch of shows back? Yeah, I mean, it's my first, I think it's Ethan's first, first. like tour. I've, I've done maybe five shows with her already, like summer shows, but okay. yeah. Yeah, my and then uh, we've got we've got like four or five shows a month until October, but this will be our first tour. Yeah, first Amazing. tour. The, the, uh, yeah, I mean the show I'm playing this Sunday with them uh, will be my first time playing on stage minus one live stream since January of 2020 with uh, the Leeds wow. Memory. How's that feel? <laughs> Fucking great. <laughs> yeah. Feels awesome. I mean, even just even just you know standing here in my studio and going over all these songs and learning all the parts, you know, for the gig, like. I've been doing it like, you know, it's easy to sit down at your desk right here and learn all the parts and stuff like that, but I've like kicked my chair out of the way. I've got like my guitars over here on my couch and I'm running it like it's the show. If anything, with less time because I'm just running through a playlist, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just And by I'm, the way, that's yeah. why I brought Ethan in because I knew he would do shit like that. I knew <laughs> I he would do the be homework. That. <laughs> well, because you've got to learn it, it standing up though, haven't you? I mean, it's a totally different ball yeah. game to playing it sitting yeah. down. Well, and we have a whole set like with transitions that he knows now and like I knew he'd be the kind of guy that would do, you know, because we're not doing rehearsal. We're going straight into this Willie Nelson gig. So you got to get a guy that's going to put in that kind of TLC on the front end. You know, yeah. I think he's probably worked harder on it than I have. I, it, honestly, at this point, I've probably played the songs more than Clint has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing. I don't know. And it's literally just going to make Clint look great when you get up there. Well, that's it. the yeah. real goal. It's like, OK, yeah, that's yeah, why Morgan's I was saying I'm not artist. a good guy. That's what I was saying. It's, it's not because I'm a good guy. I was looking out for me, man. I was looking out for me, baby. <laughs> it just, it, I mean, it can be uh, maybe a slight rarity, but I think I think maybe Clint was in a, in a really cool position where it was like, okay, yeah, you can bring in your buddy, but your buddy might tank this gig. I think it works out great where Clint has a friend like me that he's close to that he also knows he can trust to come in and nail mm-hmm. this stuff. And, and that's a perfect great, storm dude. in this world, you know? You're great, dude. Man, you're great. <laughs> Nate, I know I'm you excited for you guys. Yeah, I'm excited Thanks. for you guys. This is Thanks, awesome. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, yeah, dude. I, I, I'm, I'm excited, too. I think it's going to be... I think everyone kind of feels this sense of... I don't know how you guys feel in your worlds, but the sense of, like, the return to normalcy has been important for everybody, but I think for musicians, like people on our volleyball team, you know, we're, like, the last to reopen, dude. And uh, yep. uh, and it, the, the juxtaposition with how much people consume and love music with kind of how shitty our experience was through this whole process and the states like trying to get unemployment and trying to figure out how to get help and and survive and subsist and venues closing it just felt uh, i don't know i i felt a little forgotten as a as an industry we got told to retrain over here by the government that was just figure out something else yeah just Just, go and learn something else don't worry about spending 20 odd years learning a skill or whatever go fuck yourself they did that last year here (laughs) too and yet, and yet, music is being streamed and consumed more than ever in fucking history. Yep. So it's like, who do you think makes all that shit, you fucking idiots? Yeah. We do. And we robots. have to live. And <laughs> Well, ro- robots, AI. robots are, are, algorithms are now with corporations dictating what gets played, but we still make it for now. Yeah, for now. I mean, unless you're relying on like the 15 year old kid on his SoundCloud page who has, you know, Fruity Loops 
who never it, the commerce and the economics of making music doesn't even occur to him because he still lives with his parents right you know adults in the real world the tom yorks of the world and colin greenwoods and robert smiths and i could go on and on and and bore you guys but we need to be able to live to make this stuff mm -hmm. so anyway uh, the thawing the great thaw is starting <laughs> and uh that feels good i'm trying to trying to be positive about it yeah. Ethan, help me nate help me be more positive dude <laughs> uh, i'm the wrong guy to ask about that brother oh, Sorry. no on. you just had a great time on tour <laughs> fuck you i did yeah, you, you were positive for like shows, a man. couple of days. At now least. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the next one. <laughs> now, you, now you're grumpy, Nate. Sitting in DC. Yeah, you're gonna go eat too much Ben's chili. And Straight up, I need more. Yeah, but when you I'm were playing those shows, man, you were every post you made about every day was just like, man, Nate is just on cloud nine right now, and I, I love. Yeah, I was it really enjoying it. I was really enjoying it. Now we're waiting. Now I need more. <laughs> right. I got my fix, and I'm jonesing, boys. I'm jonesing. Well, it's because it's what we do, you know? And I like what you said, too, Dario. It's like, we I gave my whole life to this, man. It's no joke. It's like, I'm not sitting around in a garage playing a whole lot of love, you know? Like, I'm I'm trying to, like, this is all I know. Mm -hmm. So there's a real spiritual part of, like, getting back out there. I think that's what you're tapping into, Nate, is like... Yeah. I, we always get the, the post-tour blues, dude. As, soon, as grueling as it can be, even when I was in vans, as soon as I get home... You're still texting the band all the little jokes that you had and trying to explain them to your wife who's looking at you with the thousand Don't do that. Stare. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> exactly. But that's who you have to talk to when you get right. home is, you know, your family. So Amazing. Guys, I hope you have an awesome time out on the road. It's been great to chat to you both. Plug um, your plug your podcast really quick. Do it now. Before you go. All right, it's called it's called Metal Up Your Podcast. It's an all Metallica podcast. Ethan and I are two professional musicians, as you as you've heard for the last hour. We get together every Monday, new episodes every Monday, plus a ton of bonus content. It's a big family over there, and we bring a lot of our insights into the music industry into sort of behind the scenes Metallica talk. Plus, we talk about the albums, the songs, we break down the riffs, we do deep dives into their back catalog, we talk about their tours, we talk about their fucking haircuts. There's not so much we, we haven't get, talked about. Yeah, it's it's five years, dude. We're talking about their underwear. So you can find it wherever <laughs> you find podcasts, and we're on all the socials. Again, it's called Metal Up Your Podcast. That's a good plug, Thanks, guys. This has been I'll see fun. you guys in September. Yeah, dude, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Hell yeah, dude. And, you know, there's talk about us coming over to the UK next spring, Dario, so maybe we can hang with you as well. That would be great. That would we be awesome. We can introduce you to a lot of Metallica fans. <laughs> um, well, really good to meet you guys. Thanks for having us on your show. We're going to, of course, pleasure. kick. Cheers, course. guys. Send my best to Morgan. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. Talk soon. It's been awesome. All right, bye. bye. All right, bye. Congratulations on making it to the end of another episode of Tour Talk. You can keep up to date with us across the socials at Tour Talk Pod. So that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Patreon. Please subscribe, comment, like, and share, and we will see you next week.